to welcome everybody. Uh, before Adrian gets going, just a one quick announcement, which is that next week, uh, next week's speaker is uh, Jim Tybout, and that is a joint uh, sort of seminar that's uh, also uh, the keynote presentation from the Dynamic Trade, uh, uh, the International Dynamic Trade Workshop, which is a project that uh, several of the people who are on this uh, seminar right now uh, are part of. And it's just, we're, we started an annual workshop. This It's been in the, at the Board of Governors uh, the last year and uh, would have been this year. This year it's online. Uh, you're welcome to, uh, to, to sign up for, uh, for, for that workshop as well if you'd like to, if you'd like to participate. There's a, a link in the email with the, uh, that you received today with a link to, uh, to this. So uh, just, a, just a heads up for those of you who might, be, who might be interested. And then the week after that, Diana Van Patten will be uh, joining us covering uh, multinationals, monopsony, and, and local development. Okay, so without further uh, chatter from me, Adrian, take it away. You have an hour. People will kind of just uh, uh, interrupt with questions just like they would in a normal seminar, and then we'll have some time at the end for uh, an extended discussion. Fantastic. Thank you very much for inviting me to present this paper, uh, The Geography uh, of Unemployment. The starting point of this paper is that cities differ dramatically in their unemployment rates. For instance, in 2017, the unemployment rate was about 5% in Versailles, which is an affluent city close to Paris in France. In the same year, in the southern city of Marseille, the unemployment rate was well over 12%. Now, these gaps are not special to 2017. In fact, they are highly persistent over time. And they're also not special to France because similar gaps and persistence have been documented for instance, uh, in the United States, and you can think of Boston versus Flint. Now, these persistent unemployment gaps are somewhat puzzling because, in principle, both workers and employers could reallocate across space. They may have important welfare consequences. We know from a large body of work that being exposed to unemployment is harmful for workers, but spending a lifetime in a distressed labor market like Marseille could have dire long-run consequences. And policymakers seem concerned about spatial unemployment gaps because we see local governments spending billions of dollars every year to attract jobs. But at the same time, we know relatively little about the determinants of spatial unemployment differences. And so in this paper, I tackle three questions. First, why do we see large unemployment differences persist across locations? Second, what are the welfare implications of this dispersion? And third, in general equilibrium then, what can we say about place-based policies that target high unemployment areas? And I propose answers to these questions in four parts. In the first part of the paper, I document that the unemployment rate is elevated in Flint in the US or Marseille in France, not because workers struggle to find jobs there, but instead because workers repeatedly lose their jobs in these cities. And even for similar workers in similar industries, differences in the rate of job loss account for over 86% of observed gaps in unemployment rates. And so this key role of job loss, even for similar workers, indicates that there are systematic differences in the type of jobs offered by employers across space rather than differences in the number of jobs. And so in the second part of the paper, I then develop an alternative view of spatial unemployment gaps. And I build a framework that emphasizes the key role of employer heterogeneity across cities. Different employers offer different types of jobs and as they self-select across space, endogenous differences in the rate of job loss arise. But a key implication of this framework, which will become clear once we see the details, is that the presence of labor market frictions distorts the location decision of employers. And in particular, too many of the highly productive employers with stable jobs locate in top labor markets, leaving only employers that are not productive enough with jobs that are too unstable in distressed labor markets like Marseille. And the immediate policy implication is that uh, place-based policies that incentivize marginally more productive employers to relocate towards high unemployment labor markets uh, raise aggregate welfare which provides a qualitative justification for place-based policies like enterprises and programs. To then quantitatively assess to what extent the self-selection of heterogeneous employers accounts for observed um, unemployment gaps across cities, I structurally estimate them all in the third part of the paper using French administrative data. The estimated mall accounts for over 90% of the cross-sectional dispersion in local unemployment rates, as well as for the key role of job loss in driving that variation. The estimated mall also reveals that if employers made socially efficient location decisions, unemployment gaps across cities would close by 80%. And this large reduction indicates first that the location decision of employers is key in understanding unemployment gaps across space. And it also indicates uh, that there's some scope for policy intervention. And so in the fourth part of the paper, I then evaluate 
the impact of place-based policies with my estimated general equilibrium model. And I find that localized corporate tax credits in high employment areas like Marseille that have sizable employment and welfare gains by relocating marginally more productive employers with more stable jobs to these areas that need them the most. Quantitatively, I find that the optimal policy raises aggregate welfare by 5%, and I then contrast it with the welfare gains from a real-world enterprise zone program in France. And so the plan for the talk today will largely follow uh, these four parts. Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip uh, the related literature and jump right into the empirical exercise. For my main analysis, uh, empirical analysis, I'll use matched employer-employee data from France. Uh, why? Because it has two key advantages. The first one is that it covers a wide cross-section of workers, almost a million individuals in every year, which will allow me to break down the data by city, but also um, fine-grained worker uh, characteristics. The second advantage of this data is that uh, it tracks workers throughout their employment histories, um, and so I have a long panel dimension, which allows to control for worker unobservable characteristics. Now, this data set has one limitation, which is that I can only distinguish between um, employment and non-employment, but within non-employment, I don't know whether workers are unemployed and actively searching for a job or just out of the labor force. So to get around that difficulty, I do two things. First, I restrict my sample to prime-aged males who tend to have a high and stable labor force participation rate. And second, I complement the data with the labor force survey. In the labor force survey, I can distinguish between unemployment and non-participation. And so there, I compute conditional transition probabilities between these three states uh, by broad city and occupation group. I then use those estimated transition probabilities to infer the unemployment versus non-participation status in the administrative data. But in practice, this imputation exercise has a very limited impact on the results because this group of workers has a high and stable participation rate. But you can also replicate all the results only in the labor force survey. You're going to find very similar results, just a bit noisier. As a notion of a location in the data, I'm going to use a commuting zone, which is an area in which most people who live there also work there. So whenever I say city, location, local labor market, or commuting zone, these are all used interchangeably. To get a fine-grained notion of skill in the administrative data, I'm going to use a combination of occupation and age information. For some of the validation exercises down the road, I'll use balance sheet data for the near universe of French businesses. And then I'm going to show you also that the results hold not only in France, but, but, but also in the US. And there, I'll use the current population survey for a similar sample of workers. All right, so now let's uh, look at the data. This is a map of uh, mainland France broken down into a little over 300 commuting zones. The different shades of blue indicate differences in average unemployment rates um, for each commuting zone throughout the sample uh, for prime management. So Paris is up here with a relatively high unemployment rate because the Paris commuting zone includes not only the inner city, but also the neighboring suburban areas that have uh, quite high unemployment. The Versailles commuting zone is you know, quite close to Paris and has one of the lowest unemployment rates in the country, 5%. Marseille is in the south with one of the highest unemployment rates in the country, 12%. But there's quite a bit of dispersion throughout the country, in fact, ranging from 3 to 15%. And to put that dispersion into perspective, you can compute the cross-commuting zone standard deviation of local unemployment rates, which is 2.3 percentage points. That's almost twice as large as the uh, standard deviation of the aggregate unemployment rate over the business cycle, 1.2 percentage points. But not only is there a lot of dispersion, there's also quite a bit of persistence. And to see this, you can look at the unemployment rate in the second half of the sample in the, on the y-axis against the unemployment rate in the first half of the sample on the x-axis across all the French commuting zones. What you see is that the data lines up quite closely along the 45 degree line, indicating that there's a lot of persistence uh, um, in local uh, unemployment rates. And in fact, even at the five-year horizon, the autocorrelation is 0.86. Now, these two facts, the dispersion and the persistence, are not new to the literature. They've been documented before by Klein and Moretti in the United States. And so now I'm going to turn to my main empirical exercise, which is to unpack how differences in local unemployment rates reflect inflow and outflow rates. And so to do that, it's useful to start with a very simple stylized model of local unemployment. So we're going to think of an economy with a bunch of cities C, no migration between cities, and a constant labor force uh, participation rate um, in every city. Now, in this admittedly very simple environment, the change in the unemployment rate between two time periods is simply the difference between the inflow into unemployment and the outflow from unemployment in that period. And the inflow is simply the job losing rate, S, like separations into unemployment, times the fraction of employed workers. And the outflow from unemployment is simply the job finding rate, F, times the unemployment rate, 
in that um, commuting zone. Then in steady state, you can rearrange this equation to have the following very simple relationship between this monotonic transformation of the unemployment rate on the left-hand side and the difference between the log of the job losing rate and the log of the job finding rate on the right-hand side. This relationship has been used extensively in the business cycle literature to unpack the role of inflows and outflows. And I'm going to do a similar exercise here, but instead of doing it over a cycle, I'm going to do it across studies. And more precisely, I'm going to proceed in several steps. First, I'm going to plot each of those two terms on the right-hand side, the job losing rate and the job finding rate, against the unemployment rate to see which one is driving most of the cross-sectional variation. Then I'm going to show that these results hold even condition on worker observable characteristics, as well as worker unobservable characteristics. So that's going to be with the French data. And then I'm going to show you that the patterns are similar in US data as well. All right, so let's get started by simply plotting the job losing rate here on the y-axis against this transformation of the unemployment rate here on the x-axis. And what you can see is that the data lines up uh, quite closely along the 45 degree line, indicating that differences in the rate at which workers lose their jobs are the primary determinant of local unemployment differences. And in fact, if you do a similar exercise for the job finding rate across cities, it looks comparatively flat. And in an accounting sense, the job losing rate accounts for 86% of the cross-sectional dispersion in local unemployment rates. Now, of course, you may think that differences in the composition of the workforce of different cities, or maybe the industrial composition, may account for part of those differences. And so what you can do is explicitly control for those in the administrative data. You can project worker-level job losing risk uh, on a set of city fixed effects, industry fixed effects, and skill fixed effects. Do the same for job loss, job finding, and unemployment. And notice here that we have 232 industries and 300 skill groups. So these are already a quite fine grain um, controls. What you find is that essentially the picture barely changes. There's still a considerable amount of variation in unemployment risk at the city level. And if anything, how much the job losing rate is explaining of that variation uh, increases to 91%. Now you may also think that maybe within skill group, uh, unobserved heterogeneity uh, matters uh, in driving those results. And so in the administrative data, you can even control for worker level permanent unobserved characteristics by simply throwing in worker fixed effects in the same type of regression as the one we've done before. So here, because the sample becomes a bit thinner, I have to bin cities to identify those fixed effects a bit more precisely. But once you do so, you find, it, again, very similar results. Uh, there's a lot of dispersion in unemployment risk across cities, and it's coming from the rate at which workers are losing their jobs. So I see that there's a question in the chat. Um, so sh should, I, should I let uh, James ask it, or, or, or should I just read it and, um, and answer it? Sure, James can ask it if he wants. Yeah, thank you, uh, Kim and Adrian. So <clears throat> your, your uh, commuting zones are defined by the French Statistical Agency. How, have you checked what share of people actually live and work in different communities, yeah. particularly in the Ile-de-France region? Yeah, so you're right. In the Ile-de-France region, it's particularly, uh, you, could, you would think it would be particularly problematic because these, this is a very dense area with potentially a lot of cross flows. So I've checked in the it's aggregate. Like five, five zone in Bois in the Neo de France, something like that. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so in the uh, you know on average in the country, it's about eighty to ninety percent, uh, depending on exactly you know how you clean the sample uh, of workers who live in the, the in the in a commuting zone and and work in the same. So it's not a perfect delineation, of course. I mean, it's it's impossible to find a perfect definition, but it's it it has a quite high rate of workers who kind of conform to the intuitive definition of a commuting zone. I haven't checked exactly for the Paris commuting zone there. I would expect it to be, uh, to be, lo to be lower. Um, but these are still quite big. I mean, the, say the, the Paris commuting zone has Paris and then most of the neighboring departements. Uh, and so it, it kind of extends already quite far. Um, and the, in fact, Versailles, if, you, if you're familiar with the French geography, Versailles is, uh, in fact, the city that's almost closest to the Paris commuting zone and the rest of the commuting zone. Well, so for example, Saclay is a different commuting zone. Exactly. It, it, absolutely. And it is in the yeah, Versailles one. Lots of people commute. Yeah, yeah. Of course, from Saclay yeah. and Versailles and... Absolutely. No, so these measures are not perfect, but they're kind of the best approximation we have to, yeah. to, to do this exercise. But thanks, thanks for the question. All right, so... It, so yeah. It, sorry. No, no, go ahead. Does the job finding rate being flat across cities imply that each jobless spell is about the same length 
in, Absolutely. in high and low employment uh, regions. The exactly. problem is that in the low, high unemployment, uh, they're just falling into unemployment. It, absolutely, exactly. That's so it, it means that the duration of unemployment is quite comparable across uh, cities, and it's really the rate at which you, you, you lose your job, get fired, and, and have to move in, into unemployment. That okay. is really driving these big, big gaps. Okay, uh, thank you. All right, so, and, and so we've seen that these differences in job losing rates hold even for very similar workers, even when you control, control for these uh, worker characteristics uh, or fixed effects um, in France. Now, of course, you, know, you may think to, that to some extent this could be a French phenomenon. And so it uh, turns out you can also you know, simply replicate it in the US with the current population survey. So there the issue is that the cross-sectional size of the CPS is a bit smaller. So you have to bin metro areas into groups to, again, reduce the amount of measurement error. But once you do that, you find a very similar picture that the job losing rate is, again, the key source of variation driving the differences in local uh, unemployment rates. And so to recap, uh, I've, I've, I've argued that there are big and persistent differences in unemployment rates across cities and that these differences are primarily driven by differences at the rate workers are losing their jobs. And as Cecilia uh, uh, mentioned, they're not driven by differences in job finding rates or alternatively about, uh, due to differences in unemployment duration uh, across cities. And that's the case even for uh, essentially observ observationally identical workers, which indicates that there are systematic differences in the type of jobs offered by employers, the other side of the market, uh, across cities. So then I'm going to turn to the second part uh, of the paper, which develops a framework that emphasizes this key role of employer heterogeneity um, across cities. Adrian? Uh, yep. Before you, you used to emphasize more the contrast of that fact with the time series. Yes. And then I was just wondering, it'd be nice to see whether this current shock, I would think, may look more like the one you've uncovered. Absolutely. No, that's true. So if you, if you looked at this picture over the cycle, you would get mostly, you would get a 45 degree line with the job finding rate and a flat if you did the same scatter plot for the aggregate over time, it would kind of flip these two pictures. You would have a flat line for the job losing rate and a, and a 45 degree line for the job uh, finding rate. And you're right that what, what the, the way things look now is that there's been a huge separation shock due to COVID. Um, you may also think that the current shock is a little, uh, is quite different because it's mostly, a, I mean, it, it looks a lot like a labor supply shock where businesses are forced to stop operating. So they're forced to lay off order, whereas most of the previous recessions or more uh, changes in the underlying TFP, what, you know, how are you, you want to def define uh, TFP. But I completely agree with you that there's, you know, potentially a lot of interesting things to uh, maybe to learn from the cross section for, to learn about this, this current shock, but yeah. Uh, thanks. There's another question uh, from Sebastian. Um, Yes, hello. I was, I was just curious about the um, firm fixed effects. Like I, you have this button there, are the firms very different? Are those like smaller firms, less productive firms? Or, or... So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you later on some, some, some data on firms. And you do see that in, the, in these cities, these firms tend to have much lower uh, value added uh, per worker, uh, for instance. And that value added per worker at the firm level is, is very strongly tied to the probability of job loss. Even in the same industry, you, you just even industry. In, yes, yes, even conditional in industry, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, thanks. Yeah, super. All right, but I mean, so we'll see some data like that later. But before that, let's uh, let's build this theory that will allow us to uh, interpret this data. Uh, and so let me start with the main uh, ingredients of this uh, of this of this theory. So we're going to have many cities, and inside a given city, a frictional labor market to allow us to think about job loss, job finding, and uh, unemployment. So that's going to be like a standard uh, spatial unemployment model. Uh, but to that you know, first building block, we're going to add like the, the key building block of this paper, which is a location decision for heterogeneous employers. And so some employers will be highly productive and offer high productivity jobs. And you can think of that as a high-end restaurant with a meat specialist position. Um, other employers will be less productive and offer less productive jobs. And you can think of those as a McDonald's franchise with a burger flipping position. Of course, all jobs are subject to some idiosyncratic fluctuations. Sometimes workers fight with their managers, uh, and so all jobs will eventually separate. But these initial differences in job productivity uh, will uh, translate into endogenous differences in job stability. And then these employers will sort across cities for reasons that will become clear in a couple slides. And so because of this sorting, we'll have endogenous differences in the rate of job, of job loss. Right, so that's kind of... These are the key ingredients, and I'm going to start with a bare-bones version of that model. 
Uh, and then before we turn to the data, we'll add some quantitative bells and whistles. So time and space are both continuous, and the continuum of city sites is indexed by the local TFP of uh, any given place. And for the main mechanism today, uh, you can think of these TFP differences as uh, useful to index and rank locations, or you can also think of them as being very small if you don't like to assume exogenous TFP differences across cities. But for now, you can also think of them as reflecting differences in the human capital or the education level of the workers that are locating in different cities. And then before we turn to the data, we'll endogenize these local TFP differences through to human capital of, of the residents. But for now, we're just going to take them as exogenous. In every city, there's a fixed supply of housing for now, which results in some land rents that have to be paid to landlords who then don't consume any housing. There's a unit mass of identical workers for now uh, that live forever. And these workers like to consume a final good as well as housing. The final good is freely traded and is our numeraire. And they have flow Cobb Douglas preferences over final consumption and housing with a, a housing share omega. And then they discount the future at rate growth. These workers can be either unemployed or employed. And for now, they're going to be freely mobile across space. So there are no restriction on worker mobility for now. Labor markets are fairly standard. There's a single labor market in every city. And workers can search only where they live and during unemployment. Unemployed workers then randomly meet vacancies in their local labor market according to a Cobb-Douglas matching function. When they meet with an employer, workers Nash bargain over wages with the bargaining power beta for workers. And then during unemployment, workers either produce something at home or earn some unemployment benefits, which for the uh, sake of this presentation, we're going to immediately specialize to a linear function of the local TFP because that's going to capture parsimoniously the idea that unemployment benefits are constant replacement rates over past wages uh, in, the, in, the French, in the French data. But it's going to help a little bit with tractability, but in principle, you can have any functional form you'd like there. All right. So that, is, that was the standard part of the model. And now we're going to add the, this building block, which is a location decision for heterogeneous employers to that otherwise standard um, uh, frictional and uh, spatial uh, model. And that location choice for these heterogeneous employers is structured in three steps. First, employers pay an entry cost, and then they learn something about how good they are. I'm going to call that quality and denote it by Z. And you should think of this Z as really governing uh, expected productivity once you start to operate. So this is where employers learn whether they're a high restaurant and have a meat specialist position, or whether they're going to open a McDonald's franchise and hire some burger. Pit. Once they know their quality, employers choose where to go and post one vacancy in their local labor market. After a while, the vacancy uh, may uh, find a worker, in which case these employers draw their match specific productivity, Y0, from a distribution that depends on Z on quality, which is why quality matters for expected productivity. And to keep the exposition simple, I'm going to specialize to the particular tractable of a Pareto distribution where the tail index uh, is inversely related to quality. But in, in paper, I show that you can work with more flexible uh, or other distributions, uh, if you like. And so here, more productive employers, high quality employers, draw from a right skewed distribution of productivity, which means that they're uh, more productive on average. If they decide to produce together, the employer and the worker produce YT times L, where YT is the match specific productivity, and L is the local TFP of the place. And so this is where these local TFP differences across cities rank cities from the perspective of employers because of this technological complementarity in the production function. The productive unit is the match. And so you, you can think of these employers in different ways. You can think of them as uh, firms that operate a single worker, or can think of them as big constant returns to scale firms that operate many matches uh, at the same time. And so in the McDonald's example, most of the low productive burger flipping position are going to go to Marseille, while the high uh, productivity headquarters services may go to Versailles. This is really a job level model that doesn't take a particular stand on the boundaries of the firm. And then over time, productivity fluctuates here according to a geometric ground in motion, which is really the continuous time analog of a ra uh, random walk with drift. And because this productivity process is persistent, it ties together the productivity of a job at a given point in time and the probability of job loss. And so more productive jobs will be more stable. Of course, when productivity is low enough, the job terminates uh, and there's an endogenous separation. But importantly, because this productivity process is the same across all cities, uh, differences in the rate of job loss will have to come from something else than the productivity process itself. All right, so we're going to now solve this location decision problem by background induction. We're going to start by figuring out what an employer conditional on being in a given city does whenever they keep the worker or let the worker go. 
once we know their value of being active in the city, we're going to take a step back, integrate against this Pareto distribution uh, of match-specific productivity to compute the expected value of entry in every possible location for a given employer, and that will allow us to characterize the location choice of these employees. But starting with the value of being active in a given city, an employer in city L with match-specific productivity Y and a worker uh, that's, that's producing with the employer has a value that's, that reflects several elements. The first one is the flow surplus from the job, which is simply flow output minus the worker's opportunity or cost of operating in that match. And the opportunity cost is the foregone unemployment benefits and the foregone option value of searching for a different job in the same labor market. Of course, here I've already solved that for the uh, wage bargaining. And so employers get uh, only a slice one minus beta of the entire flow surplus of the match. And then because productivity fluctuates over time, there is a continuation value uh, that arises because of changes in future expected productivity. So the first derivative here encodes the contribution of the negative drift, and the second derivative here encodes the contribution of the volatility and the productivity process. Now, of course, this uh, you know, value function holds only when the match finds it profitable to keep operating, which is when productivity is above an endogenously determined separation threshold y bar. And that threshold is jointly determined with the value according to the value matching condition that says that matches break up when there's nothing left on the table. And so uh, an endogenous separation um, occurs whenever productivity crosses the separation cutoff at which the value must be zero. And then you also have the smooth pasting condition, which is essentially a first order optimality condition with respect to the cutoff. Now, conveniently, the cutoff and the value can be jointly solved in closed form in this situation, which is convenient to then uh, take a step back, take the value uh, at a given match specific productivity, integrate it against the starting productivity um, of these employers to arrive at the expected value of entry across all possible locations for a given firm. And so an employer with quality Z, um, in the end, maximizes their expected value of entry across all possible labor markets, which can be boiled down to these three, three terms here, which encode three forces that drive the location decision of these employers. The first term in blue simply says that more productive, high quality employers value relatively more cities that are better suited for production either, uh, because they have higher TFP. And so that can arise again, you know, for exogenous reasons or in our kind of broader interpretation of these L differences because uh, workers are you know, more skilled in some city than another. But this term here doesn't have anything to do with the presence of labor market frictions. Uh, and so it's not going to create any sort um, uh, of, of, of potential uh, need for policy intervention. But it's part of the location decision of these employers. The second term in orange here is a bit more interesting because um, it is uh, tied to the presence of labor market frictions and is going to be at the uh, heart of the policy implications we're going to discuss uh, down the road. And so this term, what does it tell us? It tells us that more productive, high quality employers value relatively more cities where it's easier to find workers as measured by this Q, which is the vacancy contact rate, which itself depends on the endogenous tightness of the local labor market. Why does this term show up? Well, simply because more productive, high quality firms uh, generate higher profits regardless of where they go. But then that means that for them, waiting longer until they start production uh, with a given worker is relatively more costly because they're foregoing higher profits. So it ends up looking like these more productive employers higher, have a higher opportunity cost of time, uh, which results in this, um, in this orange term. But then again, because in equilibrium, the vacancy contact rate depends on the pool of vacancies relative to the pool of unemployed workers, the tightness of the local labor market, I'm going to follow Marshall's terminology here and call this complementarity, a labor market pooling complementarity. And then the last term that determines the location decision of these employers uh, is simply the expected cost of labor, which uh, can be summarized by the reservation rate. All right, so now we have more productive employers that value relatively more cities that are better suited for production because workers are better or infrastructure is better or um, in the end, local TFP is better there. And they also prefer cities where it's easier to find workers. And so to understand uh, the nature of this sorting, um, let me uh, discuss a little bit this labor market pooling complementarity by going through some simple arguments. And for instance, it's useful to think about why these productive employers, the one who have uh, stable jobs, don't go to Marseille, where you have many unemployed workers and where it would seem that it is easier to hire. So what's happening um, here is that in Marseille, the unemployment rate is high, yes, but wages are also low. 
And so low wages, cheap labor attracts many of the unproductive employers to Marseille. So much that these, the presence of these unproductive employers uh, that pose their vacancies attached to uh, unproductive jobs crowd the labor market, making it harder to hire uh, for any potential entrant in Marseille, even though there are more unemployed workers. Um, and so the really productive employers, they don't like having to wait a long time to start production, and so they're going to go to Versailles, even though they have to pay higher wages there. Um, and the flip side is that the unproductive employers um, who don't mind waiting a bit longer to start production are going to go to Marseille, where they're going to get to pay uh, low wages. All right. So this is the logic between, uh, behind this labor market pooling complementarity. And together with the technological complementarity, they're going to play the role of single crossing conditions and uh, push these employers to sort across cities. And the sorting will then be sustained by the adjustment of the reservation wages across space. And so the sorting of employers eventually will translate into differences in the rate at which workers lose their jobs because of this key link between productivity and job stability. Now to understand why, given this sorting, uh, the job finding rate may be flat across cities, it's useful to turn to the location decision of workers. So on the worker side, it's, it's a bit simpler. Uh, free mobility simply equates the value of unemployment across space. And the value of unemployment can be written as the reservation wage relative to the local price index, which is the local rents to the power uh, omega. Now, these reservation wages reflect two things. They reflect the present discounted value of actual wages that are paid to workers if they find a job. And that depends, of course, in, on the equilibrium quality of employers who decide to locate in that city. Uh, and so the better the employers, the higher the wages. But the reservation wage also depends on the job finding rate, which governs the expected rate at which workers expect to find jobs. Uh, and so here we see that it's in essentially uh, key to have housing in the mall, because otherwise, given this indifference condition of workers, uh, that would then simply equate reservation wages across cities if there was no housing, given the sorting on the employer side, we would need big differences in job finding rates across space to make workers uh, indifferent. And that would be counterfactual. And so here, the presence of housing is providing an additional source of adjustment through which workers can be indifferent across cities, essentially uh, in terms of real wages, uh, although there are large differences in nominal wages uh, across cities. And that is then consistent with potentially flat finding rates across space. Now, of course, that's just a possibility statement. It doesn't tell us that finding rates actually have to be flat across cities. And to understand why they, you know, we should expect them to be flat in this uh, model, it's useful to then break them down into their two uh, components. And so the job finding rate in a city depends on the worker contact rate, which depends on the tightness of the local labor market. And remember from the sorting on the employer side, we know that tightnesses uh, are going to be different across different cities. But then pushing back against those differences in contact rates that come from the sorting on the employer side, we have the differences in the conditional success probability that a given contact results in a viable job. And why do these two terms push in opposite directions? Well, in Versailles, uh, although workers don't meet many employers because uh, tightness there um, is low, these employers are highly productive. And so conditional on a given contact, uh, these meetings translate in a viable job um, a large fraction of the time. And so the success probability is high. In Marseille, on the other hand, uh, workers do contact employers a bit more frequently, um, but the employers there are less productive. And so many of those meetings result in a dead end. And so these two forces push against each other, which will eventually result in, put in, in flatter job finding rates across cities. Um, and in the paper, I won't have time to discuss it uh, during the talk today. We can talk about it in the Q&A, but um, you can eff effectively check in the data whether these two terms move in, these, in opposite directions, resulting in flat finding rates. And that's indeed uh, what the data seems to suggest. All right. But before looking at the data, uh, let's characterize the equilibrium a bit more precisely. So you can show that under some conditions, there's a unique steady state, and that in the steady state, there's positive assortive matching, meaning that more productive employers go to cities with higher TFP. Now, of course, the tightness of the labor market there uh, is also an endogenous object and drives the strength of the pooling complementarity. And so to understand what this pooling complementarity is doing to the equilibrium, it's useful to consider the limiting economy in which those exogenous differences across cities uh, disappear. And so all these Ls converge to one, and so these cities are ex ante identical. Now, due to the pooling complementarity, these cities are still going to be different ex post. They're going to have differences in the tightness of the local labor market and differences in the equilibrium quality of employers who locate there. 
And more productive employers will go to cities uh, that have higher vacancy contact rates where it's easier to meet workers. And so what this result is telling us is that this labor market pooling co complementarity that arises because of labor market frictions is strong enough to create some form of agglomeration that makes cities look different exposed even though they're the same example. And so in the presence of small exogenous TFP differences across cities, it's gonna provide a strong amplification force uh, that will make cities look different um, uh, even though uh, they have a small exogenous uh, differences to begin with. Okay, so the sorting will then uh, translate into uh, differences in the rate uh, of job loss. And so to make this uh, connection precise, uh, it's useful to acknowledge that the job losing rate uh, uh, depends on three key elements in this economy. It depends on the starting point. Um, there, sorry, there, James, you have, uh, you have two questions? Oh, I, I can't hear you. You need to unmute your mic, James. Sorry for that. Um, no yeah, two, two questions. First of all, am I right that, the, um, that there's no transfer cost for goods as a single uh, goods market in this, in this French economy? Right. Yes. You don't have to worry about locating your customers. Okay, second question, am I right that workers are all identical? Yes, so that's for now. We're gonna make them uh, different in the quantitative uh, model, but for now they're, they're identical, correct? And the, reason I, the reason I ask both these questions is your paper very much brings to mind the, the recent paper by Don Davis and co-authors on skill sorting in French cities. Now that paper has free mobility of goods, so then that way it's the same as you, but they, their, whole, their whole objective is to explain this really, really strong uh, matching of skilled uh, high, uh, high uh, occupation workers uh, co-locating in, in big cities in France. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So could you, I don't want to get you too uh, off track. Yeah, no, no, that, that, that's a very useful point. Talk about that, that paper since it seems so closely related. Yeah, yeah. There's, I mean, there's a, I mean, also in the US data, there's a sense in, uh, I mean, it seems that there's a lot of sorting of, of workers uh, uh, by scale across cities. And that seems to be very strongly related to population density uh, in general. And so bigger cities or denser cities have a higher share of high skilled workers. So that's definitely true. It turns out that in the data, and so there are some tables in the paper that I didn't have time to show today, but that population density is very weakly related to unemployment differences. Uh, so these two dimensions seem to be a little orthogonal. And so this is why to a first approximation, it's, it's, it's useful to start with a mall without uh, any worker heterogeneity, and then you can add a layer of worker heterogeneity, as we're going to do later in the talk, uh, to to bring it a, a step closer to the data. Uh, but so again, and it, but again, uh, skill sorting to a first approximation doesn't seem to be a strong determinant of uh, spatial unemployment differences. We've seen that in the data already, and that seems to be uh, partly due to the fact that skill sorting correlates highly with population density, but population density doesn't correlate much with uh, unemployment differences. So that's a that's a fair answer, but skill sorting might be another reason why productive firms locate in big cities. Absolutely, and so this is why we have these L differences, these TFP differences that for now are just a kind of catch-all thing that may capture market access, as you, know, you mentioned trade costs, market access, you, know, you have an airport for historical reasons or stuff like that. And then we're gonna endogenize part of this L through human capital differences. That is gonna bring them all closer to this idea that you know, maybe in some cities you only have high school, you have a lot of high school output. Super, thanks a lot for that question. Uh, before we get to that quantitative extension, let me briefly describe uh, how the job losing rate is determined in equilibrium uh, in, the, in the simple model. So it depends on where these matches start out, the, new pro the productivity of new matches, that, that's the uh, equilibrium Z. Then it depends on when these matches break up, that's the endogenous separation threshold. And then it depends on how fast productivity depreciates between the starting point and the end point, and that's simply the negative drift of the productivity process. Now you can uh, solve uh, in closed form for this entire uh, productivity process in every city, which is useful to derive a tight connection between location choice of employers and the rate at which workers lose their jobs in that city. And in fact, you can show that the job losing rate is simply inversely related to the um, equilibrium quality of employers who locate in that city. And because we have sorting of employers across face, we should expect big differences in job losing rates uh, across cities here. Then the job finding rate has these two forces that when the bargaining power is not too big, you can show move in opposite uh, direction. Okay, so this result connects uh, the sorting on the employer side with differences in labor market flows across cities. And so before we move on to the uh, more structural models with uh, more bells and whistles, I'd like to show you 
uh, as well as the normative implications, I'd like to show you some simple moments in the data uh, that uh, seem to line up with the mechanisms that are baked into that um, economy. And so that's going to get a little bit at your question, uh, Sebastian, uh, that you asked earlier. All right, so one of the Adrian, key... can I ask a quick yep. question? Um, sure. Just, I'm thinking about Rochester for a second, and uh -huh. uh, Kodak being like a really productive business at one point, and then over time, um, there's an aggregate shock that makes it un unproductive. Um, mm -hmm. It seems like these types of regional shocks are outside of your, your framework. And right. is there a way in the data that you were able to um, dismiss that as a source of persistent differences in unemployment? I mean, the, the shock, the presence of these shocks per se would tend to, um, if anything, increase the, decrease the persistence. I mean, if there are shocks that hit the city, you know, one, go in one direction and the other, you should expect the unemployment rate to kind of follow these shocks. Uh, so, I mean, if the shocks themselves are, you know, very infrequent, you could argue that they're, uh, they're a source of these persistence. So, I mean, in the data, we've seen that it, it is very persistent. And then you can also, so it's something I haven't shown, you can control for city-specific trends. And so given my 10-year window, that would kind of absorb some of these, uh, you may think shocks like, like Kodak, uh, as, you, as you mentioned. Uh, and the third thing that I think, you know, goes a little bit against these type of shocks as a key source of unemployment gaps is that, these gaps hold even within narrowly defined industries. And so many of those shocks that we have in mind tend to be at the uh, industry level. Uh, and, and these don't seem to be, to be doing much in terms of explaining these big persistent gaps. But at the longer time horizon than the one I have in the data, I could absolutely imagine that you know, some of the, maybe you know, shocks that hit a particular employer that has a huge employment share in a given city would you know, account for part of these uh, unemployment differences. So okay. neither my data, nor my model, particularly well equipped to think of these, but these super long differences. So I think the best way to think about it here is really as a medium run, uh, medium run uh, equilibrium. Right. Uh, and it, I mean, but in principle, you could absolutely either shock the L in in the model, uh, and that would give you something a little bit like the uh, the case of Rochester, if, yeah. you, if you like. That. Uh, all right. Uh, so talking about different firms in different cities, uh, we, we're going to look at that in the data now to kind of. Uh, confirm this key link between productivity and the probability of job loss across cities uh, in the model. And so the model predicts that cities that, are, that have highly productive firms should have low rates of job loss and vice versa. So that should be true on average, but also in a distributional sense, meaning that in cities with high rates of job loss, we should expect the entire labor productivity distribution to be shifted uh, to the left in a first order stochastic sense. So you can check that with the French data uh, on, on, on the near universe of French businesses. So here on the x-axis, I'm showing you log labor productivity, so valued per worker uh, in logs, uh, in, for two groups of cities. The blue group of cities are cities with low rates of job loss. So these are cities like Versailles. And in orange, we have cities with high rates of job loss, so like Marseille. So these vertical bars are the group means. And so here you see that in cities with high rates of job loss, like Marseille, labor productivity tends to be 50% lower than in uh, cities like Versailles. And so that, that kind of lines up with the first implication of the theory. Now, you also see that in cities with high rates of job loss, the entire labor productivity distribution, which is this curved line, uh, the CDF, is shifted to the left in the first order stochastic sense, which lines up well with this second implication of the theory. And so overall, this picture kind of seems to confirm the key link between employer productivity and the probability of job loss um, at the city level. And it also holds at the firm level, uh, which you can check. Okay. All right, so having shown you some, you know, the simple moments in the data that seem to confirm the key link in the model between productivity and the productivity employers who decide to locate in a city and the risk of job loss, let me now turn to the normative implications uh, of this model. Um, so just like in any random search model, you should expect at least the standard congestion and separation externalities to operate here. And so unless the Hoja's condition holds when bargaining power is equal to the matching functional elasticity, the entry, overall entry and separation margins won't be efficient. What is a bit more interesting here is that the presence of geography creates many labor markets to choose from, from for these different employers. And so you get an additional source of externality because of this location choice and because of the labor market pooling complementarity term that I've shown you before. And so I call this externality a labor market pooling externality. And so to understand the nature of this externality, it's useful to think of an intermediate productivity firm, say a mom and pop restaurant, that's choosing between Versailles, where you only have high-end restaurants, uh, or Marseille, where you only have of uh, McDonald's. If the mom and pop restaurant goes to Versailles, it's going to be less productive than the average firm there. 
But the thing is, because it gets pooled in the same labor market as the otherwise more productive incumbents, it contacts as many workers as them. Wages turn out to not fully price the fact that it grabs uh, a bit too many workers away from the otherwise more productive incumbents in the same labor market, um, which means that on net, this uh, intermediate productivity firm is free riding the favorable hiring conditions in Versailles. Because then every firm in every city has an incentive to free ride the next best labor market. It means that on net, you end up with two excess concentration of the good jobs in the top labor markets, leaving only employers that are not productive enough with jobs that are too unstable in labor markets like Marseille. We can make this precise by writing down the planning problem and showing that the decentralized equilibrium is always inefficient, regardless of the value of the matching, uh, um, uh, matching function elasticity relative to the bargaining power. And so that's because of this labor market pooling externality. Now the question is then whether policy can do something about it or not. Um, and here, let's impose the Hosier's condition for a second. You can show that you, you can restore constraint efficiency with a set of place-based policies. And so these place-based policies take the form of corporate tax credits or profit subsidies in cities with high rates of job loss. And so Mar firms in Marseille get a high uh, profit subsidy, with it, which incentivizes marginally more productive employers to relocate there. And these more productive employers have more stable jobs, and that aligns the decentralized equilibrium with uh, the planning uh, allocation. So what this result is telling us is that the presence of this labor market pooling externality provides a qualitative rationale, at least, for commonly used place-based policies like enterprise zone programs. And here it's useful to flag that this result is, you know, contrasts with much of what the literature on agglomeration economies has found. The presence of agglomeration economies implies that we want to tax low-income locations and subsidize high-income locations. And here this labor market pooling externality is going exactly um, in the opposite uh, direction. Now, of course, if you wanted to compute the optimal overarching uh, place-based policy, you would have to include both forces in your model and quantify all the elasticities. And instead of doing that today, I'm simply going to focus on this labor market pooling externality and quantify the size of the place-based policies that would restore efficiency given this uh, externality. All right. And so to do that, we're going to now turn to the third part of the paper, which is um, to build a quantitative model that we can take to the data, uh, but that keeps all the uh, structure of the previous, uh, previous uh, simple model. Okay, so the first extension is to add uh, exogenous amenities to the mall. And so now cities differ in both their productivity and their amenities. And that will allow the mall to capture joint variation in population and, uh, um, and wages across space. To get a better handle on congestion effects, we're going to have housing respond elastically to demand. And firms are also going to be subject to congestion uh, because they're going to use housing and production with a cop dog last year. Side. Of course, the welfare gains from place based policies depends on the degree of worker mobility. And so we're going to introduce a simple a notion of migration frictions here. Every once in a while, workers are, uh, are allowed to move and receive a set of preference shocks for cities that result in an effective migration elasticity one over epsilon. And now here, going back to your question, uh, James, we're going to also allow workers to be different. So instead of being all the same, they're going to be different in human capital at birth, but all, they're also going to experience different, uh, different employment histories, and, and that's going to lead to exposed differences in human capital. And namely, human capital will slowly grow during unemployment uh, as workers learn on the job, but then it will depreciate during unemployment at a con constant rate to capture the idea that uh, there are scarring effects uh, from unemployment. And so this will provide an important source of amplification for the welfare gains uh, from place-based policies, as well as endogenizing part of these exogenous TFP differences that we had before uh, in the simple model. And then finally, to let the data tell us you know, the strength of that externality, I'm going to let uh, firms be able to post more than one vacancy at a convex cost. And so that um, allows the, the, the employers to get around the, the labor market pooling externality by doing, undoing a little bit the randomness of the search uh, in every labor market. Right, so despite these extensions, in fact, it turns out that virtually all of the previous results continue to hold uh, in that environment. And among others, you can show that employers sort along this composite index of local TFP and amenities. And then on top of the previous channels, employers also value, have a, a form of complementarity with the local human capital of the workers. And that human capital, although it is uh, you know, uh, determined by the learning and unlearning process going on in every city, turns out to be a very simple decreasing function of the local uh, unemployment rate, where the slope depends on the strength of the scarring. All right, with this 
extended model, we can then uh, go to the data. So there are a bunch of parameters that, that have to be estimated in two distributions. Um, it turns out that for most of the parameters, you can, in fact, write a recursive scheme where you get estimating equations that you can run uh, one after the other, uh, other sequentially uh, to identify most of all uh, the key parameters. It's only at the very end that you have to do a numerical search. And so, so that's useful to uh, see identification formally and see which variation um, identifies which parameter. Unfortunately, uh, today I don't have time to go through uh, all these equations with you. So I'm very happy to talk about it uh, during the Q&A and discuss you know, how you know, all the parameters of the, the model are identified from the data. Uh, but instead, right now, I'm simply going to jump uh, right uh, into the results. All right, so here I'm sh now showing you the uh, output from the simulated model at the estimated uh, parameter value. The first panel here on the top left shows the job losing rate across cities, where cities are ranked by their local advantage index, which is this combination of local productivity, exogenous productivity, and local amenities. You can see that consistent with the theory, it's monotonically declining due to the sorting of employers across space. Uh, and notice that we have a fourfold difference between the top city and the worst city um, in the economy. So qualitatively, we get uh, big differences in job losing. In proportional terms, the job finding rate is comparatively flat across cities, which then implies that the unemployment rate here uh, largely tracks the declining pattern in the job losing rate. And then due to the scarring effects, I noticed that uh, these differences in human capital across cities uh, that essentially mirror the differences in unemployment rates, and that this, these cumulated scarring effects over the course of workers' life cycle imply that between the best and the worst city in the, in the mall, you get human capital differences that can exceed uh, 30%. All right, so at least qualitatively, the model seems to generate results that line up uh, with the data. How about quantitatively? To assess the model's ability to speak to spatial unemployment gaps, I'm now going to show you some aggregate statistics, both in the data and in the model. So the aggregate unemployment rate uh, is targeted in the estimation, so it's not particularly interesting that the model can match it. What's a bit more interesting is that the model can get quite close as, at replicating the standard deviation of local unemployment rates, which is 2.2 percentage points in the estimated model and 2.3 percentage points in the data. And that comes from the fact that the model can account for roughly the right share of that variation uh, attributed to the rate of job loss, which is 85% in the model and 86% in the data. So if I, if I had time to go through this mission, I, you know, I would have ho hopefully convinced you that it is not mechanical that the model can match these moments because We've seen that the job losing rate comes from the location decision of employers, and there's no direct constraint uh, imposed by the estimation on that location decision. But to briefly convince you that it's not mechanical, that the mall can indeed match those moments, I re-estimate my mall. Um, but now, by removing all the externalities, which, which essentially uh, amounts to estimate uh, the planning allocation, or alternatively, a, a fully directed search model. So it's the same moments, the same estimation, and it, in practice, you get virtually the same parameters. What is very different, though, is the standard deviation of local unemployment rates that comes out of this estimated model, which is less than 20% than its value in the baseline model or its value in the data. And the relative shares of the job losing rate and the job finding rate are reversed. And so what this is telling us uh, is that, well, first, it's not mechanical that the, model, yes, the baseline model can match the data. And that's because the baseline model can get the location decision of employers uh, quite right relative to this uh, re-estimated planning allocation. And quantitatively, um, the presence of this labor market pooling externality, which stretches out the location decision of employers, magnifying their sorting, is quantitatively important to explain the big gaps in job losing rates and unemployment rates that we see in the data relative to our re-estimated planning allocation. Right, so quantitatively, the location decision of employers is key in understanding unemployment gaps, and it is uh, quantitatively uh, distorted by the presence of this labor market pooling externality, which tells us that there's potentially some scope for policy intervention. And so in the last part of this presentation, I'm going to focus on the fourth part of the paper, uh, which investigates uh, the impact of place-based policies on unemployment and welfare through the lens of this estimated general equilibrium model. And I'm going to run two policies uh, in the model. The first one is the quasi-optimal policy that corrects this labor market pooling externality whereby employers sort too much across cities and unemployment gaps are too big uh, across space. It's going to take the form of a profit subsidy or corporate tax credit uh, 
in high unemployment cities uh, like Marseille, according to our uh, earlier result. This is going to be a non-distortionary policy. Uh, policy uh, sorry, it is funded in a non-distortionary way. Um, and let's keep in mind that it's a pretty big policy. It produces 5% of GDP here. So let's think of it as a, uh, mostly as a benchmark. It's called quasi-optimal because the economy isn't fully efficient unless you also implement the hoses condition, but I'm simply going to abstract from that for today. I'll then contrast this quasi-optimal policy with the French enterprise and program, the Zone Franche Urbaine, which was rolled out in 96 and then expanded and targets high unemployment areas with large corporate tax credits. So qualitatively, it looks like uh, the quasi-optimal policy, but it's a lot smaller in scale and scope because it redistributes only 0.04% of GDP. Okay, so let's, let's start by looking at the employment effects of uh, such place-based policy. So to do that, let's go back to this map of France uh, in the decentralized equilibrium, where we had uh, quite a bit of dispersion in local unemployment rates ranging from 3 to 15%. Uh, so that's before the policy. Once you implement the quasi-optimal policy, the dispersion in local unemployment rate collapses to essentially 20% of its value, um, uh, to, uh, sorry, 20 of, uh, of its initial value. Why is that the case? Well, because now the highly productive employers in Versailles face a much higher effective corporate tax rate. So they move out of Versailles, go to Paris. The employers in Paris face a slightly higher corporate tax rate. So they move into Lyon and the Lyon employers face a marginally higher corporate tax rate. And so these guys move into Marseille. So everyone moves down a little bit, but in Marseille, uh, the influx of these more productive uh, employers with more stable jobs is still so beneficial that the job losing rate drops quite a bit leading to a five percentage points decline in the local unemployment rate. In, in Versailles, on the other hand, because they have fewer of these highly productive jobs, the job finding rate declines and the unemployment rate goes, um, uh, goes up by one percentage point. Okay, and then in the aggregate, because it's easier to rematch workers with a more uniform distribution of unemployment rates, uh, the aggregate unemployment rate declines by half a percentage point. And then through the lens of the mall, you can uh, translate these uh, local employment and aggregate employment gains into local and aggregate welfare gains. And so here what I'm doing is I'm showing you the welfare gains from each type of policy, the quasi-optimal policy on the left panel and the enterprise on program on the right panel. On the y-axis, we have welfare gains in consumption equivalent percent. And on the x-axis, we have the local unemployment rate of the city before any policy is implemented, so in the decentralized uh, equilibrium. And so the welfare gains correspond to the welfare gain of a resident who didn't get the chance to move uh, between before and after the policy. So what we see here is that in cities uh, with initially high unemployment rates like Marseille here, uh, the quasi-optimal policy can result in quite large welfare gains that can go beyond 20% in consumption equivalent terms because of this influx of highly productive stable jobs that reduce drastically the risk of unemployment uh, in the city. And of course, because on net, these jobs are coming from cities like Versailles, uh, welfare uh, for the residents in Versailles, Versailles declines a little bit. Now, the enterprise zone program, because it was a lot smaller in scale and scope than the optimal policy, achieves more modest welfare gains, mostly uh, in the treated locations. Adrian, can you yeah. explain what's going on with the scale there? Because it seems very uh, compacted around 6 to 7%. Oh, sorry. Yes, I should have said... So these are, I'm binning cities into uh, population-weighted bins. So most of the cities uh, are around here. And so this is, I, I do that so that you can you know, essentially compute the average welfare gain by just computing the uh, unconditional mean of this, um, of, of, of this picture. This is also to reflect how many workers are benefiting uh, from, the, from the policies. And then through the structure of the model, you can also ask what fraction uh, of these welfare gains are coming from the fact that you're reducing scarring effects from unemployment in these high unemployment uh, labor markets. So this is the part in orange here, which tells you that in cities with initially high unemployment like Marseille, the fact that the policy is now making these workers uh, much less frequently unemployed allows them to accumulate a lot more human capital throughout their life cycle. Uh, and so that gives an initial kick to the welfare gains from this uh, policy. And quantitatively, this can be quite big. In the case of the quasi-optimal policy, in the very highest unemployment cities, uh, this human capital accumulation channel almost doubles the welfare gains from the place-based policy. And in the case of the enterprise on program, in fact, most of the welfare gains 
are coming from this uh, reduced scarring effects and improved human capital accumulation channel in uh, the most distressed labor markets. You can then translate those local uh, welfare gains into aggregate numbers through the structure of the model, and you arrive uh, at the following conclusion. The quasi-optimal policy raises aggregate welfare by 5%, while the enterprise on program raised welfare by more modest 0.2%. But of course, the enterprise on program was a lot uh, was a much smaller program, and so you can get a rough estimate of you know the, your bang for the buck, if you like, by rescaling those welfare gains with the amount of GDP that had to be redistributed uh, to implement the policy. And when once you do that, you see that the enterprise on program was in fact six times more efficient per dollar spent at raising welfare than the quasi-optimal policy. And that's simply because the planning problem is concave in the size of the policy, and so you get the highest marginal returns per dollar spent close to the left affair, given that the enterprise and program was going in the right direction qualitatively. So this final calculation is useful if you think that uh, there's some distortionary cost of taxation. In that case, policymakers may want to stay a bit closer to the scale of the enterprise and program rather than going all the way uh, to the quasi-optimal policy. All right, let me now uh, conclude. In this paper, I've argued that the geography of unemployment is different by, driven by differences at which workers lose their jobs across space. I've shown that that's the case in French data and in US data, and proposed an alternative view of spatial unemployment gaps that emphasizes the key role of employer heterogeneity across space, um, and in particular across frictional labor markets. I've also argued that once, once this location choice is acknowledged, uh, we arrive at the conclusion that the presence of labor market frictions, in fact, distorts the location decision of these employers with important implications for place based policies. And in particular, it tells us that relocating marginally more productive employers with more stable jobs towards high unemployment labor markets is welfare improving in the aggregate. And quantitatively, such uh, enterprise on policies can have sizable employment and welfare gains. Now, importantly, these policy implications don't have to apply only in the spatial context and may apply in any situation in which uh, you know, heterogeneous firms are choosing between different frictional uh, labor markets. That would be the case if firms are choosing between uh, different skill markets different occupation markets, but also in the context of input-output networks, uh, if firms are choosing between frictional uh, markets there, you would also get similar policy implications uh, in these situations. And on that note, I'd like to thank you very much uh, for your attention. Okay, great. Thanks, Adrian. So uh, we'll open the floor up to questions. Just go ahead and use the raise your hand feature, and then uh, we can fire away. Unmute your microphone and ask away. I don't know where the teacher is, so could I ask a question? Oh, that's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Just break in if no one else is talking. Okay. Um, thank you for the talk, Adrian. This is great. I have a quick question on mm -hmm. uh, sorting across cities. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that unemployment is uncorrelated with skills, but then later you also showed that, that uh, it is correlated with labor productivity. So I was wondering what measure mm -hmm. of skills you were talking about and whether that labor productivity is not correlated with unobservable skills. I see. Skills. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so there, there, there's, a, there's a subtle point that you raised, which is that so higher sk on average, higher skill individuals have lower un have, are unemployed less frequently. So kind of just across skills, there is a correlation between skills and, and unemployment. Right. Um, what is... Uh, what I showed initially in the data is that the, the sorting of these skills across of individual, individuals of these skills across cities, and in a purely accounting sense, does not explain the spatial gaps that we see um, in unemployment across cities. Um, so, then, so then kind of what, how the, the, the logic of the model then proceeds is to say, well, uh, firms may recognize that workers are better or worse uh, in some cities. They're going to sort on the basis of that. And then these differences in employers do lead differences in job stability across space, but it's not directly the, the, the type of the worker that's responsible for the difference, the spatial gaps uh, in, in job losing rates. Um, so, that's, so that's one thing. And then there was the, your part of your question about labor productivity. Uh, so you can also look at these spatial gaps in labor productivity at the firm level, conditional on say the, the, skill the, the high skill share uh, at the firm level, and you're gonna find, uh, you're gonna find similar, similar results. 
which is kind of consistent with the idea that it's not purely the type of worker. It's not because workers are low skill in the city and low skill workers have less stable jobs that you get these differences um, in job stability. It, it's coming, it's acting through the location decision of these uh, employers. Um, so to, the short answer to your question, I guess, should be uh, even conditional on the, on the skill mix that these employers are using, you still find similar results that labor productivity is tied to job stability uh, at the city level. Uh, if I conditional I, and skills, I'm still a little confused uh, if skills are not perfectly observable. So by conditioning on skills, you mean conditioning oh, oh, so education here, here it's like, or education yeah, yeah. levels. Yeah, exactly. So it could be some residual skills also. You just can't identify uh, I mean, the two or not necessarily. So for, I mean, in principle, I could use the worker fixed effects. Uh, I haven't done that. So for the, right, no, labor, for the labor productivity results, I only used ob these observables. So these 300 skill groups. But remember mm -hmm. that at least for the, uh, so now I'm going back uh, to the beginning, but that at least for the basic results, like these spatial gaps in job losing rate and unemployment rates, these hold even, sorry, it's taking a while here. Within these hold groups. even once you condition on worker fixed effects. So okay. you have the, this, oh, this, wow. the yeah, yeah, so this basic fact is in fact quite robust to controlling for worker level uh, unobserved heterogeneity. I mean, these, this unobserved heterogeneity does matter a little bit more quantitatively than the observable heterogeneity. So you get to about 20% of the overall variance explained by the worker, unobserved worker effects. Mm -hmm. uh, so you get a bit further, but there's still this 80% chunk that's not explained right. by, the, by the worker specific uh, heterogeneity. Okay. Thank you. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, on the one hand, um, you make a very convincing case for the place based policies. Mm -hmm which we all want to hear, right? Because we all want to see how to get Detroit. Uh, but on the other hand, um, what about the agglomeration side? I mean, do you have any um, thing to offer us to think about how to trade off the agglomeration economies versus this? Is there any quantitative thing that you might be able to suggest to help us think about that? Um, yeah, no, I mean, that's a great point. I would, so it's, partly in the pipeline to kind of take off the shelf estimates of agglomeration economies and add them and end them there. To some extent I can, so there's a little, the mall has a little bit of flavor of kind of providing one mechanism for some form of agglomeration economies through this human capital accumulation channel mm -hmm. in the sense that, you know, these better cities are bigger on average. Uh, they have lower unemployment um, on average. So it's important to say on that because there's this residual dispersion, which accounts for the, zero correlation with population in the data but that aside on average these bigger cities have better worker better workers higher human capital low mm -hmm. unemployment rates uh, and so if you estimated in a reduced form fashion kind of agglomeration spillovers uh agglomeration you know economies where you say regressed uh, you know some measure of of tfp on uh, size you would you would find uh you know a positive elasticity here if you if you didn't if you if you didn't know that there was this human capital channel going on in the background. So the model has a little bit uh, that channel, but here it's all efficient. The human capital accumulation is, yeah. there's no externality associated uh, to it. Yeah, what I can tell you is that then quantitatively how to trade off is, well, let me see where I have the, um, here. I know I'm asking for a lot and it's fine. No, 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 but that's great. I mean, it's, it's stuff I, I, I usually don't have time to show, so I'm very happy to be able to, to discuss it. Um, if you look at this, quasi, so here I'm showing you that what's the optimal profit subsidy under the quasi-optimal policy, and you see that it goes to huge levels. Uh, I mean, this, you know, you can have a 100% profit subsidy, at, at least relative to the, to the top mm -hmm. cities. This is all relative. Uh, so these imply pretty big, uh, pretty big subsidies, uh, and so that would be much bigger subsidies than what the typical agglomeration economy uh, would tell you to do. So it seems that quantitatively, uh, this, this place-based policy would be quantitatively a bit more important than what we typically estimate as uh, going in the other direction through agglomeration economies, but then they may also interact. I mean, here, as you're shifting resources away from the top cities, the agglomeration economy is, you know, makes these cities worse, which kind of amplifies the, 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 the fact that these good firms are now leaving. And so it's not necessarily clear which way the interaction would go. And so maybe, maybe, in case, maybe even though this, the implied policies here are pretty big, uh, once you include the agglomeration economies, you would get something that's uh, mm -hmm. a lot, a lot smaller. So, no, I think that's a you know great question, and and I'm certainly very excited to you know keep thinking about those things. And if it's quantitatively feasible, and in particular, if, you know, if, if I'm able to estimate those 
agro-mission economies in a reasonable way, I think there would be a great addition uh, uh, to the paper. I really like the paper, by the way. <laughs> no, thank you. So I have a bit of a follow-up question to what Kala was talking about. Mm -hmm. So if I understand your model correctly, there's no spatial inequality at all in welfare. Um, so in the, when there's free mobile in the case, in the simple case that I've spent most of the time on this, yeah, they're all, they're all the, unemployed workers or have the same welfare everywhere. Employed workers are still different because you know, they get a job, they benefit from the higher wages uh, in, potentially in, in some cities. And then once you add the, the migration frictions, these, these, you know, the usual fresh air shocks, in an ex ante sense, you know, expected utility, the expected utility of a mover is still equalized, but then expo you have exposed welfare uh, differences depending on the realize, realizations uh, of these shocks. So, so your, your, your optimal policy is all about aggregate GDP. There's correct, correct, correct. Yes, yes, it's not. It, you're not absolutely right. Regional inequality at all. Correct, correct. It is, it is an efficiency loss. Um, that's money being the policy. But with important, I mean, in some sense, with important distributional effects, once you implement in particular these, uh, these human, cap, human capital gains, you could, you could rephrase the, the gains from the policy in some sense that uh, workers in Marseille uh, have inefficiently low human capital because they're just you know, thrown into unemployment repeatedly and so they, they, they never get to accumulate as much human capital as the planner would like them to do. But that's true, purely from an, inefficient, from an efficiency perspective, aggregate output perspective. That's correct. I, I feel like I've asked way more than my share of questions, but if nobody else is going to ask one last question, what do you do about the fact that about 25% of the, of the workers in your DADS panel are work for the state? I well, that's, that's, yeah, I mean, so I include them. Uh, okay. I mean, first of all, I, I don't think, I, so I don't remember, I should know that number, but I'm not entirely sure it's like as high as 25%. In I, I calculated this number myself. I might have done it wrong. Okay, okay, no, no, I mean, it, it, I mean, okay. So. 25% so of hours worked. I see, I see, I see, I see. Uh, they probably work a little bit fewer hours than the. Whatever, just, but, you know, but, but, yeah, rough, rough order of magnitude, that's correct. Uh, well, so that's, I mean, they're there and there, uh, but. As I've shown you, the, the results are virtually unchanged once you look at within industries. Uh, and so, you know, public sector is just like a collection of some industries. And so, so that doesn't seem to uh, affect the results empirically too much. I mean, you can, I've, I've, uh, early on I had tried excluding the public sector or including them in, and you get, you know, pretty much the same, uh, the same results.